What's going on, everybody? We are live on the air right now, 7 This is Mark D, and I have a special guest in the building with me today. And a lot of people that's listening right now, if you are tuned in to 7 Mile Radio and you've been following 7 Mile Radio, I'm sure you know about this guy, a good friend of mine. I want to call him Dr. Charles Bell a little bit early, you know what I'm saying? But uh, Charles Bell, state representative candidate Charles Bell, is here with us today. How you doing, brother? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm good, man. I'm good, man. Staying alive, staying uh, you know, out of out of harm's way. As long as I do that, I'm all right, man. I understand that. And um, as I just stated earlier, you are running for state candidate, state representative. Yes, I am. District in four. District Four. In District Four. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, things going on in in politics as a whole right now. Yes. You know what I mean? It's a lot of people um, that that are getting into politics, and there's a lot of people who already feel certain ways about politics and politicians. Mm-hmm. So, um, with you running for, first off, explain to us what what is state representative for people who you know just know the title but don't know exactly what it is by definition. What is state representative? Uh, what is what does it function as, and what is it, what do you do? What is the job? Well, that's a two-fold question. I think uh, the first part of that question is what does a state representative typically do um, in terms of education, in terms of um, legislation, and Lansing. So the state representative goes to Lansing, represents the part of the district he or she is elected to right. in terms of their, their interests in education, funding, roads, bills. So the state has you know several legislators, uh, and we pretty much just represent our, rep- our our district. We represent the people that come from our community, that work in our community, and live in our community. So, okay. So, as a state representative, you will represent the people that are in District Four, exactly, and the face of the people in Lansing who hold the power to change mm-hmm. uh, the legislation, the laws, and things of that nature of that area. Exactly. Um. It's a lot of people, again, like I brought up earlier, that that feel like uh, politics is all crooked. Mm-hmm. Uh, majority of the politicians out here are crooked. Um, what is it about Charles Bell that uh, people should believe in? Why should people give them, give you their vote? No. What is different about Charles Bell? How can we be convinced that you are not like these other politicians that are? Are out here. It's a very good question. Um, the first part of that question is I actually came from Detroit. I actually grew up in poverty, so I know firsthand experience of what it's like growing up and not seeing, you know, resources in my community, and it hurts. You know, it hurts to see not only my experiences, but my family growing up, um, not having opportunities to advance, and not just just not knowing where to go to get those opportunities in education, employment opportunities. So I think one of the reasons why I decided to run for state representative is just I felt that we could do a lot better. I felt that change was necessary in my community. I felt that we can do more in education. We can inspire our children to chase their dreams. And, you know, I had conversations with children in my community who didn't even believe college was an option. Hmm. And, you know, when I sit down, I have my Ph.D. Um, researcher. And I study the school to prison pipeline and mass incarceration. So I'm looking at the research. I see all of these different pathways that lead to incarceration. But this college thing, there's very few, you know, the, the, the pathway to college is very murky. You can't really see it. And I remember my experiences trying to get to college. I didn't, I couldn't see it. Right. I was just going to school, going through the motions and hoping that this worked out, hoping that something, you know, a miracle happened. Because I didn't know anybody that went to college. Nobody in my family went to college. So when people told me, stay in school, my first thought was, why? You know, why would I ever want to go to school and stay in school? And the only people that I knew that actually had anything worth having were the factory workers and the drug dealers. So I felt that in my community, um, just my success alone inspired me to, you know, pursue change. And I think when when we look at real change... The laws have to be changed. You know, we need change that, that works for us at the top of this government. So that's one of the reasons I definitely said I'm going to stick my name in the hat and 
put myself out there as a candidate to run for state representative in District 4. Now, you, you put a lot of emphasis on change. I hear you speak about that a lot. Yes. I'm uh, Facebook friends with you. I see you post about change a lot. What are some of the things? Uh, well, the first things, the first things that you would change if you were get into office? Well, I think that that's a twofold question. You know, it, it, my vision for a state representative is very different than the typical state representative. I believe a state representative should have activism, should, should be very knowledgeable in research, and that should inform policy. I feel like if you don't have one of those components, then your ability to make policy is significantly hindered. You have to be well versed in best practices. You have to be in touch with the community that you represent. All of it, not just a certain sector of it. And you have to make comprehensive, you know, reforms that address the needs of that community. So it's not just about going to Lansing and representing the community, voting, treating the job as if it's, you know, a, a nine to five or whatever, and just going back home. It's about staying in the community, deeply embedding yourself in the social problems. Mm -hmm. And when people say they, when, when children say, I don't believe in college, you need to be the, the leader in the community that says you can do it. And let me show you how. So it's about carving out the pathways and legislation for our children to be successful. Carving out the pathways for our families to be successful and showing them how to do it in the local community. So, so uh, again, with this change, um, with if we're going to have change in the system, we must first have change or, or, or a different type of politician or people exactly. in the office. So what is it that is, is that is different about a Charles Bell? Because we've had, per se, uh, 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 politicians who have came up and lived in the city, born and raised in the mm -hmm. city, and experienced poverty and things of that nature. But we still may have not got the... Um, you know the, the results the, the results that we wanted from these particular individuals mm -hmm. so again like how can we be convinced or, or, or what is it that is different what is the change about charles bell's sit what is it that you're going to change about even going about is if there's any change about it exactly so i think when you look at my background you look at the experiences and the and the um the things i bring to the table um, being a professor, being a um, researcher, being in the community, being the homeless. You know, I, I fed the homeless out of my own pocket because I felt, you know, when I looked at the problems in my community, homeless people, you know, the fact that we have people walking in our streets that are former U.S. veterans, lots of them. Right. Yeah. You know, former veterans that don't have food, don't have water. You know, that is... It's, it's morally reprehensible We can do more We have to do better We have to do more For the people That have fought for our country So that's number one So just Deeply embedding myself In the community I'm not a candidate Who just threw my name In the hat Then ran and got Some political experience Or ran and got Some experience In the community I am a candidate Who the district actually asked me to run. People in the community were asking me, you know, maybe you should consider politics because we see you, we know your story. You know, we know that you came from little to nothing and we see that you've done so much. Maybe your story can inspire other students. Maybe your story and your experiences can help other people. And just navigating all those different obstacles that people in the community navigate. You know, social security, 20% of the district it depends on social security daily and you know when we talk about water affordability when we talk about you know the day-to-day -day necessities of life a lot of people are denied social security mm -hmm. so that means their lights are cut off that means their gas is cut off they need to know how to navigate the application process and that's one of the things that I've I've been a social security disability examiner for five years. I understand the program, I understand the impact it has in my community. Therefore, as a resource in the community, I can help. And I think it's just that genuine nature of what I've done in my past, the past, you know, 10 or 15 years, just really embedding myself in the community, helping people. Um, guiding people to the resources that I had no idea existed but when I found those resources I didn't just keep them to myself I looked back and I think that's the key component you have to elect a, a representative that truly shows you that they care and when you look at my background and when you talk to people in the community 
You know, when you ask people, you know, who's giving out school supplies? You know, who's giving out free haircuts in the community? Who do you, who can I turn to for social security help? Who's really out here helping people? Now, I I, I don't follow, haven't been following pa- uh, politics that uh, fluently uh, over the last uh, recent years. Um, now, I'm not so I don't know how much of a change there's been in um, the state representatives or the people that we have in office right now. But um, I can say that I've lived in Detroit uh, forever and I've seen the change that's going on in the community over the last 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And um, I would like to imagine or from what I hear, I'm hearing these same names over and over and over as Mm -hmm. if these same people have been in office and in some of these positions for a long time. Exactly. Um, so, with that being said, what would give people the impression that something is going to change with having these same people in office in these same spots? Well, that's the part of the problem. You know, if you keep electing people based on name recognition alone, nothing will change. We have to elect people who are experts in the social issues that affect our community. You know, we have a serious problem with. You know, incarceration in our community. We have 24,000 black men right now that are in prison. And at the same time, we have a conversation going around in terms of legalizing marijuana. Hmm. You know, how improper is it to even engage in that discussion and not even discuss the black men who are in prison for selling marijuana? You know, how can a government profit off of that? So it's just those kind of inconsistencies. You know, you need people who are very knowledgeable on the subjects, on these issues, who can take that expertise to Lansing to inform legislation. Because as a researcher, I can tell you one thing. I've been frustrated for several years as I, you know, look at the research, look at the data on several issues like education. You know, we know how to educate our children. We know in Detroit, we know what it takes to produce successful students. Yet when I look at the legislature, we're doing the exact opposite. Hmm. And that makes no, it made no sense to me at first. And then when I started looking a little deeper into what was going on, I started looking and seeing, you know, they're working backwards. It seems as though this Republican legislature, you know, if you if you really want people to come to a city, what do you do? You bring good schools, you bring safety, you bring jobs, you bring, you know, opportunities for growth. But if you want people to leave, you tear up the schools, you create hostility. And, and crime in the community, you take away you know, their jobs, you take away all the vital components that produce a successful neighborhood. So they're literally working backwards off the research. So what you're saying is, uh, from your observation, that the politicians that are in place right now are doing more uh, to tear down the city, doing more detrimental things to the city than they are to help. I think that is a, a good way to put it for a lot of them. Not all. And, and that all goes back kind of to what I was at, you know, getting at earlier about as long as some of these people's been in office and, um, you know, a lot of the issues that affect our people in the, in the uh, urban communities still being an issue. Mm-hmm. It would be safe to say that these people don't put any energies or efforts towards solving these issues because they have a disconnect due to not living. They don't they, they're not around here. Exactly. They don't live here. Um, on top of like you know I've been on a couple of uh, campaigns with you and we speak to people who have never heard of or spoke to or even know the face of the person who is the state representative in their in their district exactly so so how how can we how can we mm-hmm. uh, you know expect these people to fight for the issues of those people well, they haven't even spoke to those people to know what the issues are that affect those people mm-hmm. and it's all about outreach you know you have to judge a candidate based on what they've done not what they promise you they will do and when you look at a candidate's resume and you look at the community the community is always the litmus test or the judge of a candidate or any kind of representative because if you can go into the, the community and they, and they tell you I've never seen this person this person's never done anything you know, that's a serious problem, very serious problem. And I think you can go into a lot of communities where they've never met their representative. They've never talked that's, to them. That's kind of dangerous when you think about it. That's like very. I have someone that represents me. Exactly. This person represents me, but I don't even know them. Mm-hmm. They don't know my issues and I don't know their agenda. Exactly. And that's a key word, the, the agenda. 
because we see a lot of agendas that are playing out in, in Lansing and, and in local politics in terms of education. You know, right now, Detroit Public Schools, today, they're talking about bank, you know, bankruptcy might be an option. You know, chapter 9 filing. Wow. For a school system that was run under state management. So, you know, how, did, how did that happen? How did it get to the point where, you know, it was completely run by state control, taken from the Detroit Public School, you know, Board of Education. And still at the point of bankruptcy. And uh-huh. still at the point of bankruptcy. You know, I bring at a surplus in 1999, and now, you know, we're talking about a billion dollars in debt. And, and, and 99, was it still controlled by DPS? Yeah, 99 was still controlled by DPS. Test it's, scores were in the middle to high average, you know, and... So that's like an over. obvious statistic to me that, I mean, when they t- took over... Exactly. That was part of the problem. Uh, it was part of the problem. So the state needs to take their hands off of education because we know what we're doing here in Detroit. They obviously don't know what they're doing in now, terms of education. Children. When we talk about education, let's let's uh, backpedal a little bit and let's let the people know a little bit about your credentials as far as education is concerned, as far as uh, what you've acquired and as well as um, you are a professor as well at uh, Wayne State. Oh, Oakland University, Oakland University, in Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan. Okay. So I'm working on my PhD in soci- sociology with a specialization in social inequality. I actually um, teach racial inequality and criminal justice courses at Eastern Michigan and Oakland University. I have a master's degree in school psychology and my bachelor's degree is in psychology. Um, it's really been a very, I say all that's a mouthful, but it's been a very um, interesting and insightful ride getting all that education and um, I never imagined that I would come this far you know I'm one year away from my doctorate and I know if I can do it any child in Detroit can do it and, and I think being a representative being someone who truly cares about the education components in our community and cares about student outcomes you know I know where the scholarships are I know the people that will guide students to the right direction. I sit on the Wayne State University um, board and you know the graduate council, and I sit next to all the deans and the department heads at the university. So when a child can actually, if a child can actually tell me their dream, I can put them in a room with someone who's doing it and someone who can guide them and map out their future. And I think for a lot of children, you know, seeing is believing. If they can actually map it out on a piece of paper, they can actually put it on the refrigerator and cross off progress. You know, it, it creates this visual reminder of the fact, why am I in school? What am I doing here? If, you, if we can connect that to a goal, I want to be a doctor. This is how I do it. Right. And these are the courses I need to take to get it done. And semester after semester, I can check off this course. Did that course, got an A in it. Did this course, still on. You know, it it would give these children a lot. A lot of people, a lot of kids don't have that, uh, that that structure. Yeah, that and then that motivation, and even that you know, a person that has been down the path mm-hmm. and that it can instruct them well enough to go in the right direction. You know, a lot of no guidance. Exactly. Guidance. You know, guidance is, is critical. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, we're freestyling in education. That's what I call it. Because anytime we send our children anywhere and with no plan, you know, you know, map, you know, that you just have to find your way through it. I remember when I was told to, you know, go to college, I left home at 17 years old. And it was always, you know, it was go to college, but I had no idea what college was. I had no nobody that I could talk to about college. It was it was a very intimidating process financial aid, all these different forms, you know, credit, you know, I had no idea. What is credit? Nobody taught me about this kind of stuff, so I had to learn this kind of stuff on my own. And when we send our children into this cold world where we know it's it's working against them, and we send them there with no guidance, no focus, how do we expect to, you know, create success out of that? We have to have a complete structural environment where this is what we expect, this is what we're going to do to get you there. We're going to connect a scholarship to you and we're going to fund your education and make education a priority 
first because right now I would say it's not a priority. Right. Not in this not in this society, not in this legislature. It's not it's wow. not a priority. Wow. Um, anytime where tuition is almost to the point where it's unaffordable. I mean, it pretty much is unaffordable without student loans. For the most, yeah, yeah. You couldn't afford to go to college. So the government is kind of supplementing it, but it's it's pretty much to the point where it's unaffordable and if we don't do something about it now, Nobody will be able to, to go to college. You know, you will take out so many loans that it just won't even be worth it. A lot of people don't even want to go to college because they think about the debt that's associated. It's already coming afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know, and then when you couple that with the fact that, you know, it's a slim, it's a slim, mar- almost like going to school, getting going to college, and then getting a job mm-hmm. that you actually went to school for is just a slim chance of exactly. you hitting a home run with a 300 mile an hour ball being pitched exactly. at you. And, and, and once again, that's to the, the leaders in the state. You know, your state representative, you have to go up there and, to Lansing and advocate for your, your student body. Now, how do we have a, a film industry? I remember the film industry was here. It was one of those things where people were very excited about it and we let it leave. How did that happen? So a lot of those people that are majoring in film studies, they are getting their degrees and they're leaving immediately. So how can we produce a successful Michigan or a successful Detroit if we can't even retain? The, we don't have the opportunities here. You know, we we don't have the opportunities. All the people that exactly. are lucrative. We can't even retain the talent we produce. As hmm. soon as people get their degrees, they're leaving immediately. Hmm. Wow. You know, that's crazy. That was a good, interesting way to put that. You can't even retain the talent that we produce. And me being, I guess that kind of resonates with me so strongly because I'm in the entertainment broadcasting mm-hmm. field. And I and I know the things that I go through, you know, being in this region here in, in, in Michigan. And the, and the people that are in the same field do some, somewhat similar things and go to other places mm-hmm. and end up thriving a little bit better. Exactly. You know, because the opportunities are more prevalent down there in different areas mm-hmm. and why is the opportunity better exactly it's all about Does design it go back down to the politicians mm-hmm. some they're not fighting for us and, that, and that's the problem you know when you look at all the problems that we have in our community you know you have water affordability you know people need water period water is a human necessity yet you have no politician that's even involved because they don't see the devastation that is being caused by the increase in water rates. You know, 110% increase in 10 years. You have 20% of the population that relies solely on Social Security, in which for Title 16, it only pays out $733 a month. So truly, how can you afford a $100 water bill? How can you afford it if you're only getting $733 a month? Something needs to be done. and at least a conversation needs to be engaged at the legislature about water affordability mass incarceration you know how do we expect to solve these problems if we're not even talking about them now when is the last time you saw a a legislator maybe just maybe not to cut you off but Mm -hmm. maybe it's because to the people who are in office these are not problems and that's a very valid conclusion because if it doesn't affect them if it doesn't affect them and then they have no strong tie to the community they don't care about the people in the community then you know when I first when, when, when I first met you you put put a uh, interesting point of view uh, in my perspective about the voting system and how insurance rates, in fact, affected the voting. Oh, concept. definitely. Mm-hmm. And how people would have to register their their their, their addresses okay. outside of the city, sometimes outside of the state, uh, to get affordable driving. You know, the, a short, affordable enough insurance to actually drive here. Exactly. Which will cause them, problem. which will cause them to not be able to vote here. Exactly. And then when you couple that with all of the abandoned houses, which some kind of a way or another. Uh, People write up as maybe Republican votes mm-hmm. or whatever, writing up the votes, period, because it's not even a house there. Mm-hmm. But you're registering this house as having three voters live there for whatever candidate. Yeah. All kinds of practices. All, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know, when we talk about car insurance, you know, that is probably one of the most critical issues that affects Michiganders and Detroiters that I can think of. You know, education is definitely up there, but when we think about car insurance and how it literally, when people want to come to Detroit huh. and they think about living in Detroit, the number one thing they think about, it's I can't insurance. afford the insurance here. So I'm not coming. I don't care how good the schools are. I don't care how good everything else is. If I can't afford to live, you know, pay my car insurance, it's going to be triple what it is across the street in the suburbs. That's a serious problem. And as a researcher, you know, they always tell us, well, car theft is very high in Detroit. You know, that's bull because car theft has been decreasing in Detroit for the last three or four years. I have the data. I look at it every day. So if car theft is decreasing, and that's the reason why insurance costs are so high, why aren't the costs of insurance decreasing with the theft? It makes no sense to me. So I think we have a serious problem, and in, in, in the free press is published, you know, several times where legislators are being paid by the insurance company. Um, they actually posted a, a pretty funny article. They actually posted how many, how much money each insurance company was paying particular legislators. So when you have people that are being bought, you know, their, their vote is being bought, how can anything be changed in this society? So you need legislators that are not for sale. Which brought up a, a, a you know, goes back to a point that we came, we were talking about before we got on the air. Um, you know, how a lot of these candidates run to get endorsed exactly by people. Um, they they try they buy endorsements. Mm -hmm. How can you buy and how legit does that even sound? Buy an endorsement. Yeah, there's a lot of corruption in politics, unfortunately. So you're gonna buy someone's opinion. Yeah, it's shameful to some degree. Yeah, it is. It is, and, and, and um, that that's one of the biggest issues that I feel like. Um, it's out here in politics is the fact that money is the biggest uh, is the biggest motor. The big, it's not about mm -hmm. changing things to be right. It's like this is a, a politics, and I understand it's a job, it's a career, but people get into it for the money. Exactly, and that's the wrong reason to get into politics. I feel like it's it's a calling. That's what it should be. It should be a calling. It should not be something that you make a career out of. You shouldn't be a politician for 40 years, you know, 50 years, unless you really, truly care about it and you're really passionate about creating change. That's the only way I and can see And then on that, on, on another end of that, to be in office that long, you should have actually changed something, something for the exactly, better. Exactly, exactly. You have to You should not have the ability to, to be in office that long and the people that you are supposedly representing still be in a condition where they feel like they're fighting for something mm -hmm. for 50 yes a whole generation exactly and there should be something something should change buddy exactly i can i completely agree something you know and we need serious changes out here because people are really hurting people are giving up because they're being attacked by so many different you know pieces of legislation you know the straight ticket voting just went through and it feels like democracy is being unraveled in Michigan. All over the country. All over the country. I mean, when you look at we ain't even got to talk about the police brutality and the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the overbearing cops out here. And, exactly. You know, civil rights is just going down the drain. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant struggle. It, it really is. This is why you need people who truly care and want to see progress made. You know, if there's no progress being made and we're going backwards and something is wrong in Lansing, something is wrong in Washington, D.C. You know, too many people eating steaks and lobsters and not, you know, really getting into the issues that affect the people. You know, a lot of people, they pursue politics, as you said, for all the wrong reasons and we don't hold them accountable for it. You know, you shouldn't be able to get in politics with no concrete agenda that helps the people and when we see your agenda going in a different direction there should be some sort of mechanism to recall you i feel like some ways you know the the, the the politicians have rendered the people to the point of feeling so powerless that they can do nothing about it you know what i mean because 
everybody's been voting and doing whatever they call, you know, so-called supposedly being able to do for so long with no results that now it's like, okay, what can I do? How, how can I, this politician is off, is in office. I didn't vote for him. He would have been in office. Like, it's people that don't even believe in the voting system. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think when you, you need a historical, you know, people need to understand the his, history behind uh, voting in this country particularly for black people you know the first time we were able to get the right to vote and this country immediately plotted to take it away from us so poll taxes you know literacy tests to take it away immediately so once the civil rights act um, was passed the next agenda was to okay we'll give them this on legislation but there is this endeavor to trick people into not believing their vote matters. And this is why, you know, you see politics being polluted with money. And this is why in 2000, you saw the Republicans pretty much steal the presidency, mm. by rigging the machines in Florida. You know, there's just so much corruption and that just demoralizes a voter base. And it pretty much paves the way for someone like a Governor Snyder to get in And we know exactly what he's doing. We know he's messing everything up for us. Yet, he's able to get in not once, but twice. Twice. What is is your views on this situation uh, with Kwame Kilpatrick? Okay, being sentenced to 20 plus years in prison. Or something that now it is alleged that our current mayor mm-hmm. is, is 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 currently involved, involved in himself. In. Exactly. So first of all, I think um, as a sociologist, I look at everything in terms of an agenda. What is the agenda here? Why was Kwame incarcerated when we know politicians all around this country are doing? Uh, all kinds of things that may not be right but why was he specifically singled out and when we think about this bankruptcy that happened in Detroit we think about um, Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick we think about his mother we think about their political power and the fact that they truly cared about our community I feel as though they had to be moved out of the way in order for this uh, I call it a, a fake bankruptcy because we know that Detroit was never truly supposed to go bankrupt. It was forced into bankruptcy by poor policy and legislation. Mm. Same way you see with Detroit Public Schools. Lots of similarities there. Lots. So when we when we look at a, a mayor, and if you don't believe race is a factor, you are sadly mistaken. You're delusional, to be honest, because when we look at race in this society we know that black people are being treated and have always been treated in a different way than white people have been and this is why you know you don't see mayor duggan in handcuffs despite a charlie LaDuff story that's pretty much very robust mirrors yeah what was going on with kwame and all the facts are there you know you have you know money that pretty much is being misspent federal money at that and lies, multiple lies have been told, and the city of Detroit is just forced to sit back and watch this unfold. But watch it unfold in a manner that's almost um, very—it's it's very a slap in the it's face. It's a slap in the face. That's exactly yeah, right. because mm-hmm. because we're watching this happen while this dude is still in office, exactly, still in operation, still getting paid, still mm-hmm. tight. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the government, the governor. Um, it's paid off tax dollars as well. Mm, exactly. So we're still paying this dude while we know. And I'm going to say no because the hard the, the, the evidence is there. Mm-hmm. The hard facts show, you know, as much as he want to deny it or uh, jump around the bushes about it. Oh, yeah, the mayor definitely is involved in something. We know that for a fact. We know that for a fact. And the, and the fact that he's still free is, like you said, it's a slap in the face to all Detroiters. Because lots of Detroiters believed in Mike Duggan. They truly believed that he would be the change Detroiters. And, and a lot of people are very heartbroken by this situation. When I look at my community specifically, I feel like 
the fact that it's betrayal. It's betrayal to a lot of people that you, know, you look at Kwame. He's doing more time than murderers. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And then we have a guy right here. Mm -hmm. And what what will make this situation worse? Let's eliminate the whole race situation, right? Mm -hmm. Is that supposedly we are in the condition that we are in because of what Kwame supposedly done? Exactly. Mm -hmm. But now we are doubling back and doing getting done the same way, while we are in much worse of a condition that we were in when Kwame supposedly did the things to get us here. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it make it make that worse on that per on the second person? Oh, doing? definitely, definitely. I mean, first of all, we we I think the narrative has been constructed to blame Kwame for everything, and we don't even think about all the, the positive things Kwame did. We just highlight all the negative things he did, and he did do those things, and they should be talked about. But we can't blame the the situation in Detroit solely on him. Solely on him because car insurance was high. Before Kwame took office, you know, crime was high before he took office. Jobs were scarce before Kwame took office. So, and those problems still persist, and they're actually a lot worse, to my in my opinion, than they were under his administration. So, when we look at all these issues that we're dealing with, and the fact that we are emerging from bankruptcy, we're trying to, you know, get this, um, get back on our feet. We're trying to reestablish you know a new identity not this bankrupt you know broke Detroit but a new Detroit one that's you know for everyone and that's what we're trying to do that's the direction I would like to see Detroit go in but we see this narrative being played out where Detroit is not being every for everyone there's two Detroits where where people in the community feel that downtown is being um, highlighted emphasized and, and pretty much the focal point of growth in Detroit, whereas the neighborhoods are suffering. Now you don't see anyone in the neighborhood really doing, you know, too much. It's not too much to do. You know, I mean, we have lots of problems. I mean, you got, you know, there's multiple abandoned homes in my community. There's no jobs. So when you come to the community, that is where you find out what the people. You know, during my campaign, during my door-to-door -door campaigns, there, there have been senior citizens that have told me they're so afraid of what's going on outside that they don't even sleep at night. They sleep during the day. Huh. Wow. I've heard that multiple times. So how do you expect, you know, how do you expect people to stay in the city and actually feel comfortable being in the city. And they're not safe. And they don't feel safe. safe. They're sleeping during the day because they're too afraid to sleep at night. And I think when we talk about recruiting uh, new people to move in Detroit, despite the fact that we have ongoing problems with the residents that affect the residents that are here, we need to help the residents that are here first. You know, we're putting people, you know, our priorities are wrong. <laughs> Our priorities are all messed up in the, in the city. And, and the people that have been here, that have stuck it out, that have, you know, not left for whatever reason they have, they are being neglected. And all of this is falling on their shoulders. Everybody's, exactly. you know. And then, man, the crime. It's like, I remember, I don't know, man, maybe about, I want to say about five years back, it was almost like every year. You know, around the end of the year, the holidays, it was just a new horrific type of crime. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just new, just something crazy. It was just escalating. You know, last year we had the, the lady with her kids in the freezer. Yeah. You know, and the year before Terrible that, it was, it, it was something else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And every year, it seems to be spiraling in the you know in the wrong direction. Well, Things don't seem to be getting any better. You know, when, when you think about all the problems that are happening in Detroit and, and the news, the media, what what positive things are going on here? What media outlet highlights the positive accomplishments of Detroiters? Now you have tons of students that are honor roll students that are scholarship recipients. When do you ever see that on you know the news? You never see it. 
when you see the news, it's it's a horror story. I mean, it's just it's sad story after sad story after sad story. And when you keep people in a very depressed state, number one, mentally. Number two, there's no jobs. Number three, the car insurance is so high. So it's like we've created... Physically and mentally depressing people. Exactly. We've created an environment that is so depressing. And it just is a vicious cycle that perpetuates these negative outcomes. I've know, heard, murder. I've crime. heard people that, that, that leave Detroit come back sometimes. Or some people live out of state. Some people live here and travel a lot. And I always hear... I hear this a couple of times every year. I see people post it on my stats on, stats on Facebook. Man, there's something about Detroit. Every time I come back here, I just get depressed. Mm -hmm. It's just something about Detroit. I just get sad, sad and down. It's like, man, why is that? Why is that the the aura here? Exactly. You know, you have you have to think about every society is designed in the manner to produce the outcomes it wants to produce. If we want to produce scholars, we would create a society that produces scholars. We would invest in education. We would invest in, you know, technology and science and all those things. But in Detroit, what are we investing in? What are we investing in in this country, in this state? We are investing in manufacturing inmates. That's the only thing we are really good at here. Sending people to prison. There are more people in prison in this country than all across the world. I mean, you literally have what is called a school-to-prison pipeline. Pipeline. A direct, a direct line, line from school to prison. And then you have research that shows mm. prisons are being built based on third grade reading scores. So by the time you get to third grade, if you can't read, research shows you're, you're like, probably going to go to prison. You're probably going to go to prison. And, and instead of using that research to create constructive interventions to help our children, these people are capitalizing they're on exactly, that. Exactly, they're padding. They're they're are, 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 are you know slicking the way, slicking you know slicking the road and making it easier to go down that path. Exactly from school to prison because they find out how to make money off of it. It's all about money here, and I feel like when those conversations are being um, engaged or when those conversations are, are happening, you need people that can change the story, that can bring a different perspective because. If everybody in the room is, you know, pro incarceration, then that's case closed. But you need to bring people into the conversation that are that can create legislation that is informed by research, that is informed by the experiences of the people. You know, we don't need any more prisons. We need good schools. And number one, we need local control of our schools because the research doesn't need, need to tell you this the, the people who can can make the best decisions about education in our community are those are the local stakeholders those who gain the most those who are the most knowledgeable on local circumstances the situations the resources that are available those are the people that we should be empowering to make decisions about our education system not a governor not a mayor Hmm. An elected board. But we know this. You know, this is all about control. It is all about taking resources out of our community. You know, I teach a racial inequality class. And I think it's very important to understand the framework in which this country has always operated in. And once you understand the framework, you know, everything makes sense. I feel like we have, we, you know, we see these instances replayed all over you know, police brutality, and we, we see, you know, the seizure of our school system, theft. You know, that's pretty much what it is. It's just theft. You know, these are not isolated incidents. They play directly into the framework. Into each other, yeah. And people don't people don't see those. People don't make those observations. They don't connect those dots. You got to connect the dots. You have to connect the dots. Man. So many things going on here, man. State Representative Charles Bell. State Representative Candidate Charles <laughs> Bell. Look at me speaking it into existence. Exactly. On 7mileradio.com. We'll be right back before we close the show up. Stay right there. Warning. Yeah. 